Welcome to the Music for the Soul podcast, where we talk honestly about difficult things. This is a place where music, hope, and healing come together. I'm Becky Nordquist. And I'm Steve Seiler. Today, we are so pleased to have with us Chris Fabry. Chris is an award-winning author and radio personality who hosts the daily program Chris Fabry Live on Moody Radio. Chris's novels, which include War Room, Dogwood, June Bug, Almost Heaven, and A Piece of the Moon, have won five Christie Awards, an ECPA Christian Book Award, and two awards of merit from Christianity Today. He was inducted into the Christie Award Hall of Fame in 2018. Chris and his wife live in Arizona and are the parents of nine children. Chris, I'm exhausted already. <laughs> me too. Me too. <laughs> yeah, just listening to that makes me exhausted. Thank you for having me, Becky and Steve. Well, congratulations on all of the above. I read Peace of Moon. I think Peace of the Moon, I think that was last year, the year before. Loved it. The story really stayed with me, which I think is the mark of a good good story and a good novel. Hmm. And I recently had the privilege of reading your new book, Saving Grayson, which I found profound, deeply moving, evocative. It's staying with me too. And you know, I know a book is good because I'm a, I'm a reader, Chris, and I always have four or five books on my nightstand. And I know a book is good when I've finished it and I don't want to start a new one. Oh. Mm. When I want to hang out with the people for a bit longer, when the tone of, of what I've been experiencing is just something I want to savor. And that was my experience with this book. So Saving Grayson. So thank you for the opportunity to read it and to talk about it today. Well, thanks for uh, going through it. And I think a great book is a book that you read, you close the last, or you close a cover, and then you want to read it again. Yes. <laughs> yes. So, you know, you want to go back to the very beginning because there are things that I know I missed in that mm. journey. And so that that you are still thinking about it after reading it is uh, just water to my, my soul. Well, thank you. The voice in which you write is incredible, too. And that's another big thing for me as a reader is I have to be engaged by the author. And I remember Steve sent me a copy of A Piece of the Moon, too. And I'm like, ooh. So when I heard you had a new book coming out, I was super excited. And I'm, I'm just excited to talk about this book with you today. And I just really appreciate the voice with which you write as well. And I have a lot of reading friends, so they are going to want to get their hands on this book. So I'm excited to share this time with them, too. Well, now the main character of this book has dementia. And I don't know if you know or not, Chris, but my father struggled with dementia the last six years of his life, had Alzheimer's, and just passed last year from that. So this was, just to be honest, this was painful territory mm -hmm. for me. But, you know, I think one of the things about the journey of caregiving, not just with dementia, but any, any caregiving journey, is the importance of having companions, mm -hmm. of having support along the way. And that's what this book felt like to me, I'll be honest, it made me cry sometimes, remembering my own father and my journey. Uh, but it also affirmed some of the things that I had thought and felt throughout the process. And, and ultimately, I felt blessed by reading it. So uh, I just wanted to, to get that out, out there so you know that I'm coming from a real uh, heartfelt place on this topic. You know what, that is the universal that I'm hearing, Steve, is when even when people haven't read it, but they'll hear about it or hear the synopsis of the story, they'll stop me and say, hey, let me tell you about my mom. Hey, let me tell you about my dad, my grandpa. Had somebody write, you know, younger reader who wrote, said my grandfather went through. Let me tell you about that. And when I, when you touch the nerve of that, there's something like 6 million people in the U.S. are struggling with Alzheimer's mm -hmm. or some form of dementia is bigger numbers than that. But then you think of all the people that surround that person who love that person mm -hmm. and they yes. are going through it in a different way than the person, you know, who's been diagnosed, right. they are feeling it because a lot of times the person who goes into dementia or the Alzheimer's, they don't feel the effects of it. They experience the effects of it, but they don't feel it like the others. So everybody else is feeling it for them. And so that's one of the things that I hope that people get is exactly what you said, that we're walking together with others 
mm. rather than isolating. That's what the other thing that I found is that people will isolate because it's a really terrible, you know, you don't want the person to explode in the mall and because they, they're not getting their way. And so you isolate, you, you take, mm. keep them at home, that kind of thing. And so a lot of people suffer in silence. And yes. uh, so that's what I want to deal with. Well, you know, I had a therapist tell me one time uh, that issues like these, on average, affect 40 people. You know, you start thinking husbands, wives, kids, parents, church community, work community, cousins, nephew, you know, on and on and on. 40 people on average are touched by whatever the person is going through. So that really confirms what you just shared. Why is this personal for you, Chris? Is it, or If not, why did you choose to write about this topic? You know, I had a few years ago, I had a friend, we lived in Colorado at the time, and he lived just down the street, Jim lived just down the street and his family, his daughter just got married. And so I can still remember her uh, ringing the doorbell, the dogs <laughs> going to the door and seeing her little red head just stick up over that window. That's, that's the endearing uh, memory I have of her. And now here she is getting married. Well, uh, we were at his house and his wife was get, getting rid of his tools, selling his tools. It's like, this, Jim would never get rid of his tools. Why are you doing this? And we were buying his car, a Honda Civic in really good condition. We were buying, but she was doing all the paperwork. And I thought, There's, what, what's going on? And Jim in the other room said to my wife, well, you know, this Alzheimer's thing. And his wife looked at me kind of mouth open and said, he hasn't really talked about this with anybody. So I took him to dinner. I heard more about his diagnosis, what he knew about it, what was ahead of him. And I couldn't sleep, you know, for, for a couple of nights because I was just running down the trail of what is life going to be like for him. And Jim is an outdoorsman. I've got this picture of him in the water, in the river, uh, fly fishing in, in the mountains of Colorado. And it's just this, you know, he's got the ties on the hat and everything. And he was always enamored with me that I could, uh, did the radio thing and I, could, I wrote, you know, he was out shooting elk and, and clean and deer and, you know, bringing the meat home and all that. And I was sitting in my garage office writing stories, and he just thought that was just crazy, you know, that I could do this. Uh, and to me, it was the same as as his life was. You know, he didn't he didn't plan any of this. He just did what he did, and that, that's what I do when I write stories. I just really am engaged. And so, as I thought about him, I thought, what if I tell the story of a writer? And you always have to have a ticking clock in the thing. You know, what is the clock? You have a writer who remembers a, a mystery, a, a murder back where he grew up, and he, he feels this inner compulsion to solve the mystery of this murder before he loses all of his memory. So that's the ticking clock of the whole thing. And because he's a writer, you know, he always has his yellow legal pad that he's writing all these notes that remind him of who he is. And where he's going and what, he, you know, what his job is, because he forgets it, is the short-term memory from day to day. And so what if I wrote a story about this and allowed it to bring in the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness of God that, that Grayson is desperately needing but doesn't know that he needs? That's mm -hmm. what was the impetus for that story. I love that. In your stories, you try not to force faith on the reader, but you make it organic. So how would you say that you accomplish that in Saving Grace and just to not give the story away, but just to add a little bit there? Well, I think as I was writing Grayson, I realized that I was writing my own life mm -hmm. because Grayson is a very take charge, control kind of guy. I think that's one of the reasons why I like to write stories. I can control the environment. I can yeah. control, you know, the outcome yeah. of everything. And in life, I can't do any of that. Um, <laughs> so that's why true. I like to write. You know, I get to I get to figure out what happens and make it happen. But Grayson has always worked. He has always earned love. He's always earned his paycheck. He's always, you know, done a quid pro quo. I do this, you do that. And so when he comes, there's a part where he comes to faith in his life and has come to faith. 
but he needs to be reminded that this is not of yourself. It's not you working for the mm. gift that God has given. It's bestowed on you. And the way that comes through in the story is his wife, Charlotte, he calls her Lottie. Charlotte at one point says to him, Gray, why won't you just let us love you? And it, the reason is because he has to earn it. He's got to work for it. And if his memory is going, and if he's not able to contribute like he used to, and if he's not able to fix his life, then what, what is he worth? What good is he? That's what he's struggling with on the, you know, on the inside and when he, he's writing this out. And the further you get into the story, the more I saw in myself, God's love, the love of others for me is not something I earn. It's something I receive. It's something I accept. It's something I embrace. It's something I live in, like the river that Jim goes into to fish. Mm. It's just something you have to wade into and allow it to take over you rather than something that you strive for. Absolutely. And I mean, there's the picture for all of us. I mean, I think we all struggle with that to some extent, right? I love how it's so relatable. Even if you don't relate to the part about the Alzheimer's, there's these underlying currents and themes in your books. I mean, not just this one, but other other things that you've written that anyone could relate to. You may not have a personal connection with Alzheimer's necessarily, or it might not be part of your story. Chances are, you know, someone that's walked through it. But there is that simple truth planted within the story that we can all grasp onto and relate with. Well, that worthy piece, our feeling of worth is so tied to the issue of shame. Mm. You don't have to be old or struggling with dementia mm -hmm. to experience that. That is that's sort of a universal thing where we're, we're all yeah. looking to feel like we belong, like we have value. And that's the gift that God offers it offers us if we'll receive it. And so I think that's an underlying piece of this story that's, that's very mm -hmm. powerful. Mm -hmm. You know, Chris, you just used a metaphor when you're talking about Jim and the river. One of the things that just was striking to me as a writer that leapt off the page for me was your gift for simile. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to spoil this for the readers by giving some of those away, but I found myself flipping back. You know, I'd, I'd be reading and I think, what, what was he said about, what did he say about that? And look, looking back a few pages just to sit and enjoy some of these similes that you use. And I wondered, do those come to you in the moment or do you have some kind of a process for, for looking for those? Because that's really a hallmark of your writing. Thanks for noticing that. <laughs> You're it, welcome. <laughs> it, I, I got it this morning because I've been working on this short story and I, I, was, I was just giddy coming in here because I knew... When I come into the, the office and I sit down behind the keyboard, if my heart's right, I know that there's something good for me. And um, I had this conversation with my mother and my mother loved to bake and she would bake these cakes and she'd freeze them. And anybody who came over, she'd foist them on there. She had to make this <laughs> carrot cake. And then there was an, a, a, a rum pound cake that was just, you know, people would drive for miles to get this. thing. And she said, Chris. Uh, and she passed away a year ago. She said, Chris, I feel the way you feel about your writing is the same way I feel about baking a cake. I get so excited. So when I woke up this morning and I came in here, I'm not thinking I've got to find a similar. I've got to find the right thing. It's just like I got to show up. <laughs> All I do as a writer is show up. And then I just let whatever is on the inside be mined onto the page. So those things that you are noticing, those things that you are seeing are just me uh, tripping through the hillside, finding a root or a mushroom or a berry <laughs> where, where it is by the, the exercise of walking there, of going through there. And a lot of it is mining the memories. So much of my stories and, and Saving Grayson is, is one as well. Are they're set in the hills of West Virginia? That's where I grew up. I can mm -hmm. close my eyes right now and tell you what the leaves look like in the fall, or the green in the in the springtime, mm -hmm. and the summer, and the June bugs, and you know, I that's where I grew up. So I come alive when I'm thinking about the place that I grew up in and the people who populate that place. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the shame, 
the shame uh, Grayson it has made some mistakes in his past that he didn't remember. And that's one of his recurring questions is, can God forgive the sins I can't remember? Hmm. And yes. Lottie knows too much. She knows what is back there. She knows what he's up against. Who's back there? Is who going to hold his bad choices against him? And hmm. she don't want to face it either. And uh, she she will not go back there with him because of all that shame and that guilt that is hanging over her. And so is that going to overrule their lives? Is the shame and the guilt and fear, is that going to overrule or will they break through? And it takes a man who can't remember to break them all through. <laughs> yeah. I, I have to tell you, when I read that sentence, can God forgive the, the things we can't remember? I actually put the the book down and started writing a song. <laughs> so yeah. I hope that's okay because I thought, oh my gosh. And and then I, I that evening I had a conversation with my wife about it. I said, you know, I know thinking back, there are wounds that I've caused that have just, they've not stayed with me. I don't even think about them. And it's interesting. Sometimes when you start to to do that, things do start to come back and you start to remember, ooh, gosh, yeah, that was really awful when that happened. But I think the, the grace that comes through your story is that, yes, God, God has already forgiven that. So you don't need to be burdened with trying to go back and dig up all your mistakes. Just be thankful that God forgives and that as we embrace that in our own lives, um, it washes over everyone. Well, that can be a point of grace then as well, a, a, a place of mercy, this re because the enemy wants to keep, uh, push our head down under the water and keep us down there, yes. keep us from living. Yeah. And he wants all of those, ba those bad things that happen to us to hold us back and to keep us from moving into life and keeping ourselves protected. But what God's mercy and grace does is those recurring things that allow, that accuse or that make us cringe every time. And I could think of a handful of them right now. You know, I could go, there's a proverb that I read every, you know, I read one of one a day. So every month I encounter this. And as soon as I read this verse, it's like, oh, I'm right back there with that decision <laughs> that I made. And oh, oh, that can be a place where you, if you are open to it, can allow the grace and the mercy of God to filter through. I know a, um, a couple and he committed adultery and she would drive and, and then they reconciled, but she would drive to into town and would go the circuitous route way out. So she didn't have to go by this hotel because every time she went by the hotel, boom, she's thinking of yeah. his sin and yeah. his, you know, what his offense against her. Mm -hmm. And there came a moment where she could drive by there again and look at that and say, rather than look at what happened back then, she could say, but look at what God is doing now. Mm. Look at the mercy and the forgiveness and the grace that he's given me, that I have given him and his response to this. And our, our their relationship is better now than ever. Mm. Not that go sin and, you know, everything will get better. No, that's still a, a dagger to the heart. But she's allowing the grace of God to wash over her with the vision of that hotel. And I wrote a, <laughs> I wrote a short story about it. That hotel at the end of the short story was made into a marriage retreat center. <laughs> they sold it, you know, <laughs> so it came from That's because you're in control, Chris. That's in control. That's exactly <laughs> it. Because it doesn't happen in real life usually. But you know, I, I like to think of that, that there's mm -hmm. something, something bad that can be turned into a mercy and a grace in your life. And I that's what I want to do with the story. Yeah. One of the huge themes that you tackle is suffering and our desire to avoid it at all costs. And that is so innately, you know, we want to avoid the pain of suffering and we want to avoid, you know, looking backward, like I think you mentioned Lottie and her personal struggle with all of it. You know, that's so true. Can you tell us a little bit more about avoiding suffering at all costs? Yeah. I think of a Dan Fogelberg line, promises made, promises broken. And there's one line in there, shielding our hearts from pain. Mm. And that's the natural, you know, numbing yourself to pain is another thing that we do in order to get away from it. 
and in order to push down the feeling that I have. And so why does God allow that? Why does God allow the suffering? Why does God allow the pain? Uh, why does he allow the struggle? And there was a, a, a radio friend that I had years ago, radio pastor Donald Cole, and his stock phrase would be, I think we, we aired this on a promotional announcement. That's why it kind of even grained itself in me because I heard it so much. Struggle is not a sign of failure. Struggle is a sign of life. Yeah. Struggle mm -hmm. is not, it doesn't mean that you are a failure. Struggle means you have life and God is moving. And so we eschew <laughs> struggle. We don't, you know, I like ease, the straightest dis distance between two points of straight line. Right. But I, and I don't get, I don't try to control it, but I don't get there, mm. you know? And so I have, can I see the pain in my life as a way, as God's megaphone, as Lewis talked about it, to call me to him, to remind me again, you are totally dependent on me. You don't have any control here. <laughs> you know, you can make your decisions and everything, but I'm in control of this. I'm, I have my sovereign providential will in your life that I am working out and I am using pain. How many people in the Bible do you see that? You look at Paul. You now, Paul had, I'm sure, had this uh, the dream of being able to go to everybody and t tell them, here's the good, look at what J God has done. And Jesus, I'm an apostle because not of anything I've done. I was against, I was killing these people and he's in chains. You know, he's locked away and he can't do anything but write the people that he has heard about or that he has seen and remind them. And, and think of what God did through the suffering and he even said that to Ananias, as you go over to Straight Street and you get this Saul, you know, and I'm sure Ananias thought, wait, time out. <laughs> Don't you, this is the guy that, and God says, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Mm -hmm. And I read that and I think, boy, I don't want that. <laughs> I don't no. want that in my life. Yeah. But there are just that? such gifts that come yes. from engaging in the struggle. We learn, we grow, we are broken in order to, to rebound and be able to bless people by understanding what we've been through and sharing it with others. Bang. Yeah. And I mean, ab above all, don't you think too, I mean, I keep, I'm, I'm continually reminded that the servant is not greater than the master. And we look at the suffering of Jesus and so why we think we should be exempt from suffering, first of all, because we aren't greater than he is. And the beauty that's brought through diving in deep in those valleys of pain, how we come to know ultimately the most important person in our existence, which is our holy God. It's just an incredible way that he works through pain. I think there was a lyric once that it's resonated with me for years, but pain is a tool in the hands of a surgeon. Mm. And that extraction of the things that don't belong there because I belong to him. And so if we're willing to release our will for his, it just can be that exchange of beauty from ashes. Don't you think? I do. But my struggle is that I have defined faith then as figuring out what God is doing. Mm. And because I read about Joseph and he's thrown in the pit and he goes down and Potiphar's wife and the jail and the dreams and all of that. And then he saves his family, <laughs> you know, mm. uh, the, the, the hotel where the sin was committed becomes a, you know, a, a retreat center for marriage. You know, it's, it's all that I can figure it out. I get into an accident on the street. And the person who hit me, you know, I'd lead to Jesus or I'm able to give them a Bible that flew out of the back or something. I've got to make sense of my suffering. Mm. And God seems totally willing and able to allow me not to make sense of things in the middle of them, because faith is not making sense of it. Faith is not figuring it out or fixing it. Faith is trusting, right. believing in the middle of it when I don't have mm. everything, you know, it's not clear. It's still seeing through a glass darkly. And that's seems, unsettling to me. I don't like that. I it seems, don't and like we seem that. to get that opportunity just about every day, don't we? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> really? Yeah. That it's like that open-ended, like 
okay, there's probably not going to be closure this side of heaven in this area. Mm. And that's where that blind faith and trust gets to be grown and that muscle gets worked and it can be pretty painful. Can I switch to a structure question that I've been really curious about, Chris? Sure, absolutely. The relationships of the characters are so intricate Mm. and so interwoven. And by the time we get to the end, it all comes together. And I'm curious, from a structural standpoint, do you have to lay that out beforehand? Is there like an outline approach so that you can see where you're going? Or is it back to that simile thing where you just kind of let the the magic flow? I have to know where I'm going. You know, there was one writer, maybe it's John Irving, who said, I write the last sentence of the book before I ever start anything else. Yeah, I got to know where it's winding up. Others will say, no, this is a process of discovery. For me, I want to know as much as I can about the characters and where the story begins. You know, where's the terrible trouble that you start with and where we're going to wind up. But then I kind of suspend all of that and allow myself to just jump into the river and swim around and, and, you know, <laughs> and see where it will lead me. And I'll be honest with you, this story wrung me out like a dish rag. I was on the, we've got a little concrete pad out in the back of the house. And I was face down on that pad in the spring of one year, because this took about three years to write it. I usually write about, you know, at about six months from start to finish. I have everything. This took three years to do. And I had started with a different character. There's a a man who goes with Grayson, whose name's Josh. And I had started with another character going with Josh, and I wrote it all the way to the end. I wrote the 400 pages or whatever it was all the way to the end. I had turned it in, and I I talked with my editor, and I said, you know what, This as I read it back now, a little bit of space, something's wrong, something's off, something's not right here. And so I had to go all the way back to the beginning and change that sidekick, quote unquote, and make him Josh, an African-American man who goes along with Grayson. And once that happened, then the story just kind of blossomed. It kind of opened up in a way that it didn't with the first iteration of it. And I don't suggest that to anybody, (laughs) but I think the struggle and the pain leaked into the writing, leaked into the, onto the page. I really am a big believer of that. This morning, just before I, I got up with you guys, my son said, Hey dad, there's no hot water. So it's like, ah, oh, I went out and looked at the, you know, is the all the electric on to the hot water heater? Yeah, it is. So you got to call the plumber. So it's like this, this thing that is happening in my life is I don't want this there. It is that tension that moves me further. It it causes this inner struggle. Am I going to go with it or am I going to just numb it, you know, push it aside or will I let it do its work inside of me? And that happens in the writing process for me. Mm. Well, as discouraged as I'm sure you were, I think what you've shared is a great lesson to creatives everywhere to be uh, not self-critical, but to be self-analytical, to take a step back and 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 look at your work. It is impossible for me to imagine this story without Josh. Exactly. So I'm glad you had the courage to do that. Well, I have to personally say I love the character named Grayson Hayes because I have a grandson named Grayson and I have a grandson named Hayes. Oh, really? So for that purpose alone, I loved it. But um <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to give a little shout out. That's what Mimi's do. I go by Mimi. But so, you know, earlier you did talk, we're going to stay on that technical place because we are a podcast that a lot of creatives listen to. And I go there with songwriters too during our interviews a lot. But you talk a lot about, you talked about showing up as a writer. And there's that saying of a writer writes. So I am wondering if you could give some good tips to some of our folks out there that are wanting to become writers, or maybe they're in the process. They have some ideas for a book. They've been kicking that idea around for a long time, or wondering if you could give us some practical tips for people who are writing and on that journey. I could go on for hours on this. You you stop me. 
Well, everybody wants to have written, you know, everybody wants to, to have something that they've written. Few people will actually sit down and do the hard work. My wife, Chris, actually, who is a writer, actually says, I hate writing. I love having written. Yes. <laughs> yes. I think just sitting down in the chair and, and doing it, because I'll, I'll have the people ask, you know, so I've got this story and, I've, and I'll ask, so what have you done with that? What have you well, I haven't had the time. As if it's all you need is the time, you know, you get it down it. No, it's it's a slog. It's it's no different than digging a ditch. You know, I gotta dig a ditch. I gotta get my shovel in my hand and get my gloves on so I'm gonna blisters and go out there, put my hip waders on and start digging. There's and the writing. simile. <laughs> there you yeah, go. I was writing is the same thing. It really is. And and I think here's the thing that's been rolling around my soul lately is the difference between process and outcome, because I am all about outcome. You know, I want a bestseller. I want a, I want a story that will make Steve Seiler cry. I, mm. I want a story that will make him go write a song after he's read a line in the, you know, that kind of thing. That's what I want. And what happens is I, you short circuit the process. I think it was Brian Cranston, who's an actor in you know, Breaking Bad and all that kind of stuff. And he did an interview with someone who said, uh, he said he was frustrated with uh, not getting the parts that he wanted, even in, in commercials and everything. And I think it was an agent of his who said to him, forget the outcome. Don't, don't do this for the outcome. When you go to that audition, you are giving a performance there. So just go through the process, be, take chances that if you want, do the, do the thing, you know, become this character and free yourself up to just let that be what you're doing. The audition is not, you're not going there to get a part. You're going there to give a performance. And so he said that just freed him up. And what happened was he started getting these parts after it because he wasn't so, you know, let down that he didn't get the part afterwards. Maybe it wasn't about, you know, he wasn't tall enough or he, he wasn't, right. uh, you know, he just wasn't the right person for this part. It wasn't about him. It wasn't personal. And so I've started looking at my writing that way as what is the process that I'm going through to write this story? What is it doing in me? Maybe this story is, a, is for me more than anybody else to change me on the inside. And if I yes. focus on that and I'm fully in that soup, in that river, <laughs> digging that ditch, then something good is going to happen in me. Whether it becomes a bestseller or not is really not my control. I, I don't, I don't have the ability to do that. You know, you likened for me listening to that. You likened the creative process to prayer, because we pray to change ourselves, right? To be in conversation with God and to let God speak into our hearts. So, if we look at the creative process, it's almost like a prayer. Yeah. And it's, I have this quote of Hemingway just above my computer. If I can see it here, I'll read it to you. A writer's problem does not change. He himself changes and the world he lives in changes, but the problem remains the same. It is always how to write truly and having found what is true to project it in such a way that it becomes a part of the experience of the person who reads it. So when you began and you said, this stayed with me, the character stayed with me, I wanted to stay there. That's what Hemingway was talking about. Write hard and clear about what hurts is another quote from him. And if you can, and what is Christianity, but drawing closer to the truth about God, about ourselves, and about that relationship we have with everybody else. Mm, regardless of outcomes. Right. Yeah, Just bingo. being committed to the process that we are currently in. Well, letting the big guy take care of the results. That's doing right. The <laughs> doing the process, yeah. letting the big guy take care of the results. You know, mm. if we're talking to writers, uh, talking about truth reminds me of something that I learned about my own songwriting, Chris. I, I, I began to realize that when a song wasn't working, it was because somewhere along the line, I had stopped telling the truth. Hmm. I was serving a rhyme scheme. I was trying to make some, oh, that line's really clever. I got to make sure that's in there. Well, is it true? 
does it fit the story? Is it what the message of the story is about? Mm -hmm. So I think I think serving truth, uh, and and I think it was uh, uh, Kenny Loggins who said, if it's true for you as a writer, it's going to be true for somebody mm -hmm. else. Yeah. So yeah. honoring our own truth as we write is where all the good stuff is. And that's and what did uh, Irma Bombeck say? The grass is greener over the septic tank. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yep. so much of my life is you know uh, the flowers come from the manure i mean amen it, it just is and i don't like that you know but that's it's true. true my my dad actually used to say that a lot because he had he was a person that went through a lot and he knew that the growth really came from those deep places and yeah that's so great well, can I take a moment, Chris, to thank you publicly for all the times that you've had music for the soul on your on your program, Moody Radio Network, and shared our, our songs and our topics with your listeners. It's been a great gift to the ministry. It, it's always a good experience. You do a fabulous job interviewing people and dealing with real stuff. And I have been tremendously blessed and very grateful for that. So I've never had you on. I've never played one of the songs that come from that uh, stirring of your souls that people haven't responded and have said, uh, can you play that again? Or they've gone back, you know, to hear the podcast or, or, or gotten us gotten one of your songs. It's just when you speak into the deep of a person and you touch a nerve down there, which is what I hope this will do with Grayson for somebody who's given that long goodbye, you know, to someone that they love going through that process. I hope it touches that deep nerve, just like your music does. Well, I can guarantee you that it does. I got one more. This isn't a structure question. I'm just curious because your two areas seem like different lanes to me, <laughs> yeah. the radio host and the author. And I realize they're both, they both have storytelling in common, but what are some other similarities or differences, you know, in between wearing those two hats? Well, I'm when I speak, I write, you know, I'm writing even as I talk right now, I'm writing this out. You know, if you, if you put it down on the, on the page, it probably I want to clean it up afterwards. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, when you, when I speak, I write. And when I do my program, the main thing that I'm doing there, sometimes, you know, different iterations of it. But a lot of times I'm, I'll have a guest on. And I'm just asking questions. I'm just following mm -hmm. what they say and then following the rabbit trail of the conversation to some good place, believing, trusting that it will lead me there. Mm -hmm. um, there are times when I'll have just phone calls. People call in about some innocuous thing. One time years ago, we've been doing the program that I do now for 15 years. And wow. um, I had, uh, I just said, the car that you remember from your childhood. Or what was your first car? It was something along those lines. Mm -hmm. And we got into about 35 minutes into the hour. And there was a, a, a lady who called who said, I remember the station wagon. She told me exactly what it was. And we didn't have seat belts back then, but dad would pile us all in that car and we'd go over to church and we'd have a picnic after. And she, just as she spoke, just all of this opened up. Just every, you could just he, you could hear inside of her the light that was being shown on this and it all was from that old car there was this inanimate object that that sprung to life the relationships that she had and every time we do that every time we have a innocuous conversation about something like that we get to the gospel because the gospel is about relationship the gospel is about that forgiveness that that ultimate gift that God has given us. And I don't, you know, I don't push it. I try not to force fit the gospel into a station wagon, <laughs> but it happens <laughs> organically. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's, that's the same thing. I show up every, every morning when I'm writing, I show up on that program and I just trust that God is going to take us to someplace good. Fantastic. Well, speaking of someplace good, uh, where do people need to go to get this very, very, very good book? <laughs> That's a great segue. Look at that. <laughs> you, you, wherever you, if you have a Christian bookstore in your area, go there, or even an independent bookstore that's not Christian owned. I feel bad. No, I don't feel bad. I, I, I really want to support those people who have that kind of a, a bookstore. 
But if yes. you buy your books online, uh, go to your library. That helps out too, you know, just, and your library doesn't have it. Hey, order this. That's a wonderful thing. Cause you can't buy every book that's coming down the pike these days. I know that. But if you want to go to chrisfabry.com, there's a pull down menu where you, you know, different places where you can go to get it. F-A-B is in fabulous or mm-hmm. fabricate. F-A-B-R-Y, chrisfabry.com. Excellent. So great. Thank you so much for being with us today, Chris. Seriously, it was a joy to to listen to you and to speak with you today. And you are a joy to us at Music for the Soul. And we're so excited about this new book that you've written and you're sharing with the world. God bless you, Becky. Thanks, Steve. If you enjoyed the discussion today, please share it with a friend and give us a positive review on iTunes. And please visit our website, musicforthesoul.org, where you can stream or download every song in our catalog, read our lyrics, our healing music guide, our blog posts, and much more. Thank you so much for listening. God bless. Like I'm lost